Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Abel Siris. I'm a uh, uh, history seminar coordinator at the American University <coughs> in Kosovo. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce to you today our speaker, Dr. Noel Malko, uh, who has accepted our invitation to present at our history seminar. His lecture will be about myth, ideology, and history of Kosovo. Noel Malcolm is one of the best known historians and writers on Kosovo and on the Balkans. His history books on Bosnia and Kosovo have made a difference in the world opinion about the circumstances which lead to the war during the 90s. Dr. Malcolm earned his PhD in history at the Cambridge University. He is a former foreign editor of The Spectator and columnist for The Daily Telegraph. He gave up journalism in 1995 to become a full-time writer, becoming in 2002 a senior research fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. He is also a fellow of the British Academy. He is the general editor of the Clarendon edition of the complete works of Thomas Hobbes and the editor of the correspondence. Noel Malcolm is the author of Bosnia, A Short History, 94, Orientalism, English Nonsense, 97, Kosovo, A Short History, 98, Aspects of Hobbes, 2002, and with Jacqueline Stello, John Pell, and his correspondence with Sir Charles Cavendish, The Mental World of an Early Modern Mathematician. He is the editor of the correspondence of Thomas Hobbes, and he has also written George Enescu, His Life and Music. His current scholarly endeavor is focused on the relations between Christendom and Islam in the Balkans, during the Ottoman Empire, which will shed light on such an important historical, sociological, and why not, a political issue. Dr. Malcolm. Because they do have a normal meaning of grandfather. They can show you their 
father's father and say that it's my grandfather. So to say the crocodile is the grandfather of our people is already to move to a different level uh, of understanding, some kind of uh, transcendent uh, level of explanation or description. And anthropologists have talked about this in terms of a symbolic analysis, how they talk about crocodiles and lions or whatever, the polarities, the uh, systems of belief, but they've also talked about this in a functionalist way. What is the function of myth for this society? And typically they say the primary function is that it binds the society together. A society which holds the same myths is given a kind of coherence and solidarity that it would not otherwise <coughs> possess. Now I'm not going to talk about this kind of anthropological uh, concern with myth, but I think that functionalist explanation does have some point of contact with what I am going to talk about, which is the function of myth in a society, the sort of myth we experience in the treatment of history. Now when I say myth here, I'm meaning myth in a rather deep sense, the fundamental myths that influence or frame people's understanding of their history. So I'm not talking about the casual, minor examples of things that are sometimes described as historical myths. We all know there are things that are popular beliefs, historical claims, often repeated, which happen to be wrong. Uh, and it's common to describe these as historical myths. Um, I recently read uh, an article by someone demonstrating, or claiming to demonstrate, it is a historical myth that Hitler was a vegetarian. Well, we've all heard it or read it that Hitler was a vegetarian, and this is something repeated, you can find it in textbooks, but apparently it's a myth. I don't uh, claim any expertise on this subject, but we can all think of examples of this. And maybe sometimes an anthropologist would find useful material analyzing these kinds of beliefs in our society, even a little factual error, if commonly repeated, must be commonly repeated for a reason. It encapsulates some prejudices or assumptions. We can all think of examples of that. But I'm not going to talk about these small-scale myths. I want to go deeper to what I'm going to call the framing myths of historical writing and historical understanding. Now, what are these deep myths? How do they operate in relation to history? And here we have something a little bit different, I think, from what I was describing with the anthropologist and the myth of the, the crocodile. It's not a case when we're talking about modern historical writing that there is a clear distinction between the mythical explanation and the normal explanation. <coughs> that crocodile ancestor is obviously different from a normal ancestor. But we're not talking here with historical myths <coughs> about some explanation that is declared to be absolutely different from normal historical explanation. This is why historical myths are more difficult to deal with and more important to deal with, because they claim to be proper historical explanations. Let me give an example. If someone from Romania tells you that the Romanians are directly descended from ancient Dacians and Roman soldiers, Roman legionaries, and that this is demonstrated by the Latin nature of their language and by some archaeological evidence about Dacians and perhaps by some continuity of folk beliefs that show the ancient Dacian religion, well, this is not a supernatural account. 